Today's scripture reading is John chapter 17, verses 20 to 26. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one, as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. The United Church of Christ uses as its motto this phrase from our reading today that they may all be one. Formed as the ecumenical movement coursed through Western Protestantism, this denomination, our denomination, was a merger of mergers, and it professes to embody Jesus' call to his followers to unify. As Betty Jane and Mark taught us a few weeks ago, the evangelical and reformed churches and congregational and Christian churches came together in 1957 to create the UCC. And since then, even more diverse churches have joined from many different denominations and no denominations. For example, this past year here in New Jersey, a group of progressive Reformed Church in America churches duly affiliated with the UCC, seeking a denominational affiliation that would allow them to ordain LGBTQ clergy and continue to boldly witness their justice-seeking ministries as some in their denomination move to push it in a more conservative direction. So, is this merging of a few relatively small denominations in the United States in the 20th and 21st centuries the idea of unity that Jesus was praying for? Does it mean that our denomination thinks that all Christians around the world should cast aside their denominational affiliations and disparate traditions and form one organization? What would the name of this united church be? Who would be in charge? What hymnal would we use? And what language would we worship in? Impractical, presumptuous, perhaps even a bit colonial-minded, given Christian history. So what good is Jesus' prayer? Is unity something worth striving for? And what would that even mean? Jesus' vision of oneness is exemplified in his relationship with God. Without going down the rabbit hole of Trinitarian models, we can at least say that this version or vision of unity is a little bit messy. How exactly are three distinct entities one? And if they are one, are they really three? Quickly, we see how futile it is for human concepts and words to express this idea. Even without wondering about the question of the Trinity, philosophers of science, along with theologians and other thinkers, have long sought to get to the bottom of the puzzle of what unity even is. How is it that life is unified, that people are unified? Is it that all life shares one elemental building block, like atoms, and thus we are unified? Is it that God unifies us in, our, in God's creative power? Or is it that we merely need to organize our understanding of the world such that it creates one cohesive explanatory theory? I learned that the concept of an encyclopedia was meant to demonstrate this unity of human knowledge. Models of unity abound in public life. Our country, e pluribus unum, the melting pot, 
the United Nations. Everywhere, it seems, humans are striving for this mysterious unity. And even core foundational tenets of our belief, like the Bible, can be seen as an attempt to unify, in that case, compilations of disparate writings and stories from multiple authors and sources and contexts into one book. So it's a rather illogical concept, unity, but a persistent one that has intrigued people for millennia. In 2019, the idea of unity is used by political candidates to quell debate, sometimes even sidestep pointed debate questions. It's a refrain against calls for Brexit and against independence in places like Catalonia and Hong Kong. Perhaps unity is not as popular an idea as it once was. In the church, we no longer talk as much about ecumenism, but about interfaith partnerships, a respect for other traditions over a desire to unify within one tradition. And perhaps ecumenism is beside the point when fewer and fewer people even identify as Christians, as yet another Pew poll has confirmed this month. Even Nicholas Kristof weighed in on that, blaming those other Christians for the demise of real Christianity. Unify with them? In science, we have learned that there is not a universe, but actually multiverses. Unity is secondary to diversity as a collective goal for corporations, countries, and congregations. So why hold on to this ancient prayer for oneness? In her book, Holy Envy, which many of you read last spring, Barbara Brown Taylor recounts another story about unity from the Bible. It takes place shortly after Noah's descendants have repopulated the earth after the great flood. And so they set about building a tower, which we come to know as the Tower of Babel. The people reasoned that they should concentrate their efforts on building a city, a tower, with its top that could reach to the heavens, lest, they say, they should be scattered abroad upon the whole face of the earth. And God says, huh, all these people who by my providence have survived and are flourishing, and they're all there in one place. They are one people and have one language. God says, this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do now will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. Now, as Brown Taylor points out, this is often told as a tale of divine punishment that because people were bold enough to think that they could build a tower that would reach the heavens, God frustrates their efforts with a reminder that God is more powerful than human works. Postcolonial scholar Emmanuel Larte has a different take on this story, that perhaps it's an admonishment against dominance, not diversity, and a reminder that people should not seek unity by hegemony or power. The moral is that God favors the diversity of many peoples over the dominance of one people. And I like to imagine that rather than punishment, maybe God just had a little bit of a sense of humor or was a little bit bored and wanted to make things more interesting for God's self and for people. After all, it's a testament to God's immense faith in us that God would bless us with a greater challenge and greater diversity. God said as much that nothing that they propose to do will be impossible for them. Now, some Christians say that the story of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, that allowed the gathered crowd to speak new languages and understand one another in languages that they didn't even know, might be the story of the reversal of the Tower of Babel. But perhaps it wasn't a reversal, but just a continuation. That same God who believed that people are capable of impossible things continues to give people the tools and gifts to be living manifestations of God's love on earth. To return to John and our reading from today, Jesus was not telling his disciples in this final prayer of his to go rebuild the Tower of Babel, to go back to being one people and speaking one language, but maybe he was anticipating the Pentecost event and and imagining the possibility of wholeness beyond language and tribe and region. Jesus imagines that God's indwelling The coming of the Holy Spirit will be continued to be revealed in all of those who seek to know and love God and their neighbors. Jesus' desire for unity is not meant to be the demise of diversity, but another call from God to humans to not stop here.
The 13th century mystic Mechthild of Magdeburg said, the day of my spiritual awakening was the day I saw and knew I saw all things in God and God in all things. Richard Rohr claims that Christ is another way of saying one or another way of saying everything. That while Jesus shows us the specific way that God is incarnate, Christ is the total and universal way that God is imminent here on earth. The oneness that Jesus prays for is not just between people, but an extension of God's very unity with all things. Jesus' prayer is not just that his followers would get along, would stick together despite differences in points of view or opinion about how to further the emerging movement. But Jesus wants the same awareness of God's presence, God's very being that he knows in his bones, to be known by all who would hear of him. He wants the disciples not just to teach as he has taught, to tell stories as he has told them, but to know God's love as deeply and fully as he has. Jesus says, I made your name known to them, and I will make it known to them, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them. To trust that God is really with us, in us, in everything, is to trust in a unity that is before, beyond, and between any human creation. To know the deep unity of all creation is to set in perspective the goals of unity we seek within human organizations. This past summer at General Synod, which is the biannual national gathering of the UCC, where denominational business is conducted, there was a contentious debate that gave us a vision of how this unity is tried and tested within our supposedly unified denom denomination. Many of us are proud of our churches and the national settings embrace of an open and affirming theology and proclamation. And because of our context, it may be easy to assume that this is par for the course for most UCC churches. But in fact, only about a third of UCC churches are open and affirming. And there is another group of churches that um, have a formal gathering within the UCC and describe their theology um, as faithful and welcoming. They are, as you might predict, less than affirming of LGBTQ people and describe themselves like this. We are evangelical, conservative, orthodox, or traditional, and we're still here in the United Church of Christ. Emphasis theirs. So at this past synod, a resolution was introduced to remove the faithful and welcoming group from displaying in the exhibit hall. This resolution sought to ensure that general synod exhibit hall displays were consistent with UCC declarations, core values, and resolutions. It asked that no group working against civil and human rights for LGBTQ people or any other constituency shall be allowed exhibit space in general synod halls. It asked that the synod reject the mission of faithful and welcoming churches as it relates to denying the full civil rights and ecclesiastical standing of LGBTQ persons and affirm that the United Church of Christ motto, that they may all be one, precludes giving voice to bigotry. After a few days of emotional debate, delegates heard from LGBTQ teens who voiced hurt and pain from seeing members of the church that they had experienced as a safe space express rejection of LGBTQ acceptance. They heard also from LGBTQ leaders, including the leader of the Open and Affirming Coalition, who said that as painful as it can be to encounter hurtful theologies, it's also some of those same churches who are slowly moving to a process to become open and affirming, and that excluding all of those in that group would hinder those encounters. And still more people expressed that while they disagreed with the content of the faithful and welcoming displays, they felt a deep commitment to the call to be one, to stay in covenant and communication with one another. In the end, the resolution was tabled. Delegates Delegates asked the UCC board to work with historically underrepresented groups to create a behavioral covenant for future synods exhibit halls. Was this the right decision? I'm not sure. But I was inspired by the way that so many people trusted in the covenant that we have with one another in the UCC, inspired by their ability to trust in that unity enough to disagree publicly and respectfully and vulnerably, 
inspired that so many seemed to know a deeper unity, one that can be tried and tested, not taken for granted or used as a bludgeon against dissent. Is the UCC's commitment to unity through covenant a useful model in other contexts? When we don't share underlying tenets of faith or common purpose or history, what is it that binds us to our neighbors and urges us to seek unity? What images of oneness or wholeness or unity relieves our anxiety about whether to compromise or to agree to disagree? Whether to unify based on doctrine or tradition, identity or ideology? Allows us to relax the borders of our minds and ourselves to recognize the already unified spirit. In these days when borders and division seem much more real than unity, we are tasked with reattuning ourselves to find that oneness with God, for ourselves and in the world. This week I was at a First Friends training, which some of you have also been to, in preparation to become a friend, a regular visitor for an immigrant detainee here in one of the local jails. First Friends is an organization, a small and mighty organization that does many things, but in my assessment, on a spiritual level, they seek to give people who have been separated from their families and society an opportunity to be reunited for half an hour, a few times a month, to be reunited with human connection. They believe deeply that people belong together and find ways to make it so. Over the summer on the Texas-Mexico border, a group of artists and professors assembled a few bright pink seesaws that use the border wall as a fulcrum for this playground equipment. Physical demonstration that what happens on one side of the wall affects the other side, and that a wall is a false symbol of division of what can never really be divided. The collective said about their work that it demonstrates that our relationships with our neighbors can extend past political relationships, and that this is incredibly important at a time when relationships between people on both sides of the wall are being severed by the wall and the politics of it. <laughs> Separates not only countries, but regions, cities, neighborhoods, families, and more recently, the separation of children from their parents. Even as walls and policies continue to divide, there are persistent and creative attempts to demonstrate that relationships are not broken so easily, and that the spirit is always seeking to show us how we are already one. Amen.